think we, we should start. It's, uh, it's a wonderful afternoon outside. I would like to welcome you. My name is Elke Ostimore. I'm the head of the Visual Arts Department of IFA, Institute for International Cultural Relations. And uh, I'm pretty happy to welcome you somehow also on the occasion of the gallery weekend. And of course, as an international cultural institute, we would like to bring uh, somehow also other kind of perspectives inside of this um, global art market, let's say. That's why we uh, thought we bring some of our cooperations and cooperation partners together for this uh, panel discussion, but also uh, for a very special book launch later on and a wonderful party tonight. So, um, uh, yeah, I would like to welcome uh, you and especially Alia Septi, the director of the IFA Gallery in Linienstraße in MIT. And I would like to um, give you the hint that her new program, an annual program, just started, uh, Untie to Tie, with a solo exhibition of Pascal Martin Taillot. You can see it till July, June 12th, right? And um, uh, as well, inside of the gallery, as also part of this annual program on colonial legacies, uh, we also invited uh, the, uh, the, our magazine, the Contemporary and Magazine Art, Contemporary Art from African Perspectives, the chief editor, uh, Julia Grosse and Yvette Mutumba, to install a so-called reading room, and uh, the title is The Center for Unfinished Business. Um, and uh, we will come to these uh, topics later on. And of course, we uh, invited um, different uh, cultural producers from around the world, and especially also from Berlin. I would like to welcome Bahare Sharafi, Sharafi, Sharifi, sorry. Uh, she's from Berlin, an uh, activist and curator. Alia Septi, who is going to moderate uh, the panel discussion later on, will introduce every single uh, guest. And I'm also happy to welcome uh, Mara Limon from uh, Netherlands, right? Uh, curator uh, from there, and uh, Rolando Vasquez, also right now based in the Netherlands, but uh, with another background who will hear about this uh, and his decolonial uh, summer school later on. And I'm very happy that we also have a cultural producer from the music scene, an artist, musician, DJ, producer, Lamine Fofana, also based in Berlin. Uh, so I think I would give the floor to the panel and especially uh, to Alia Septi, who is going to moderate this panel where we uh, on one hand, ask the question, is this term of coloniality, how, what does it mean in the everyday uh, cultural practice of us? Is, is it still an actual term? Because we, as a cultural institute, we are quite um, interested in, uh, in the structures and uh, organizatorial, but also political and cultural structures and institutions and in the whole art market, and later on we will reflect uh, critically on this term of global art. So um, yeah, and then later on we will uh, hand over uh, especially to our most famous media, which is a DJ, a music set, um, uh, after uh, presenting our first printed issue, no, not first pr printed issue, but the first uh, edition of a book of Contemporary End. And I don't know if I should maybe later on speak about this or now. Yeah, okay, so we do it like this. So um, yeah, let's have a wonderful afternoon together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I will start with, uh, with the first question, actually, which was the why, and it's the question we all asked ourselves, like why, why this panel discussion um, we, we had, so we started this program dedicated to colonial legacies and contemporary societies. It will be a year-long program, 
But one of the key element, one of the quick key question is uh, why why are we doing that? Uh, like it's it's um, as a gallery, as an institution, uh, but also why it is a, a subject that kim, keeps coming back again and again, and. Uh, we come from the position that we know that we don't know and we will learn, we want to learn together. And that's why it's a year long process. That's why we have a lot of discussion along the year. We have this very first panel discussion also with people who are coming from extremely different cultural practices and who each one of them is uh, working in some way with a critical approach to this idea of um, decolonized practices. So um, I will go like a little bit on the formal side for two minutes, just for very short biographies. And then I hope we will also decolonize the panel discussion and not make it too serious and formal. <laughs> so um, it's, um, yeah. So we have, yeah, Bahare. Bahare, you, uh, you have been uh, working a lot as a curator and activist. Um, and uh, now, since the beginning of the year, you are, um, you are the program manager for diversity, art, and culture. Um, and um, I, will, I will ask you to tell us a little bit more about mm -hmm. what, what it is and to describe it for us. Mm -hmm. Um, we just so it's called yeah it's called um, diversity arts culture um, the how do you translate it in English um, the project office for um, diversity management uh, for the arts in Berlin uh, Berliner Projektbüro für Diversitätsentwicklung für den <laughs> Kulturbereich um, <laughs> yeah a very long title. Um, so yeah, so basically it's um, diversity, like the, the question on who has access to the arts, it's, it's a big one in Germany and mostly I think one of them maybe like for at least a decade we have a lot of discussions um, f also um, in, for example, in, this, um, in the theater, in, on performance scene um, with the term um, post-migrant theater arose, where it was like, okay, we have, um, yeah, we have such a diverse society and it's not represented. Um, but yeah, for, for such a long time, we're not actually getting anywhere. So the, um, the, yeah, more or less the Senate of Berlin, the new Senate of Berlin decided to come up to kind of like um, fu fund a project which is trying to f work on um, how to diversify um, the arts, the art world, arts institutions. Um, and um, so we have, we kind of like in, in a lucky position to have 2017 um, to come up with programs and then start in 2018. Because like um, one of the really main issues is that you don't have um, any data when it comes to um, how diverse cultural institutions are. I mean, ge in general, Germany is not really good when it comes to data. And the only data they get, like the, it's not very nuanced. So they don't, for example, it's usually um, what they kind of like try when it comes in terms of discrimination based on books racism or something, then it's m migrant background. So in, in the art world, you end up with, um, there are a lot of people with a migrant background, but it's more like from European background. It's kind of like, um, a you have a lot of like Swedish people and Dutch people and it, within the, but it's, that's not diversity. That's not how the society looks like. You don't have kind of like local diversity. You don't have people with disabilities or LGBTIQ um, people represented in those institutions. So you need, f one, one of the things is that we will initiate kind of like, um, yeah, programs to, to get the data, um, to have kind of like, a, yeah, legitimate back, yeah, or, or foundation to argue to, s to start working on that. 
And the, another thing is to find out what actually marginalized artists and cultural workers actually need and what kind of like barriers um, they confronted with. So th these are kind of like the main, the main fields we're going to work on for, the, for this year. It's fun for this year and then hopefully we can continue working on that for the next couple of years. Thank you. Actually, I will, uh, I will grasp the word uh, diversity um, to, to talk about the, the work of, uh, of Imara. Imara as a freelance researcher in uh, Dutch colonial heritage. Your work is taking the form of exhibition, publication. You have been working extensively um, in, uh, in Amsterdam and beyond also about this idea of this, uh, the, the, this idea of diversity. And uh, actually before uh, we had a, a very quick conversation and as a half joke, uh, you were mentioning that everything that that has to do with, uh, in the, let's say, uh, realities of Amsterdam, with cultural diversity, where people would come to you and ask you, so uh, you became the spokesperson of the diversity. <laughs> but, um, I mean, could you, could you share a little bit with us, with your experience in Amsterdam, working for an institution also, about this question and how it's related to the question of diversity and colonial legacy? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, first of all, it's, I think, mostly for me, it is um, starting from this <laughs> spokesperson thing. It is mostly because I, yeah, last year I did an exhibition as a guest curator for the Amsterdam Museum, and it was called Black Amsterdam, um, uh, yeah, dealing with black people in Amsterdam. And um, the, the project was, uh, for me, a starting point of working with more institutions, more people on the topic of di di diversity, inclusivity. And that's why it suddenly <laughs> I, was, I was dealing with it everywhere. And um, before I was doing this freelance and it was um, mostly a practice that I did for, for curators, for um, artists. Um, and uh, when, it, when my practice became more institutional, I really realized that this is, um, that Amsterdam is very small in that sense. That, but apart from that, I'll just uh, introduce myself a little bit. Um, uh, when I started working at the museum, uh, the project was a participatory project. So the museum, it's a city museum uh, with the collections of Amsterdam um, and yeah, all kinds of different collections. And with this project, the intention was to, to be very close to the first uh, Black History Month of the Netherlands, um, where I was making a program uh, for as well. And um, this Black History Month, it's, it's, it was in October, and the exhibition also opened in October. And for the first time in the Netherlands, this was really huge, like every day talking about diversity and inclusivity, um, uh, although, I also realized that this has been going on for decades. People were referring for the first time back to the decades that this was not discussed um, with a colonial history of yeah, hundreds of years. Um, and the, the museum project was a participatory project with people from Amsterdam, asking them what their black role model was. And we encountered so many things um, that went, for me, they went straight back to what the museum is doing as an institution. And for the museum, it was very much like, okay, it's an outreach project in first instance. Maybe everybody knew that outreach is an outdated word, but do you really know it? Do you do it in your practice in daily life? Or um, are you actually going to think now, what is the institution doing? So I decided that I had to stay, I couldn't just do a project, I had to stay and and um, when we mentioned the institution being a white museum, what does that mean? Um, it didn't end there, it started a lot of discussions internally and what for me, that my practice ever since has been like, okay, thinking about what are we doing on a daily basis ourselves and how do we actually make, um, how do you say that, um, a, a plan for a, diver a diversity policy because it didn't exist in the museum, it didn't exist. Um, so all these kind of surprising things, on the one hand being very progressive with these programs, but on the other hand still being very old-fashioned in a daily practice. To, to keep it short, I'll just stop there. Um, and um, I will stay in the same area actually uh, to, to, to speak about the work of, uh, of Rolando because you are an uh, assistant professor of sociology uh, at the University College Roosevelt of Utrecht University. Um, and uh, you are also, you coordinate the decolonial summer school in uh, Middelburg. And um, 
a lot of your uh, researches uh, are around uh, this uh, three, let's say, inter interdisciplinary topics of post-colonial thinking, uh, visual social experience, and uh, the critique of, uh, of modern time. Um, it's, um, for, for me, it's, uh, it's really, uh, you, like your writing have been an extremely inspiring uh, element in the, in the making of, of, this, uh, of this program. Um, and um, it's, it's, it will be more to ask you uh, also through your, the presentation of your work, um, what is like your, um, I know it sounds like a very broad question, but like your critical position to this idea of uh, post-colonial uh, thinking and the, the critique of modern time within the realm of the university, but also, uh, I will ask you more to present in detail the, the decolonial summer school. Okay, maybe I start with a small uh, presentation and we can talk about the deep issues a bit later. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, f first thank you very much for inviting me and I'm very grateful to be here. Um, well, I will say briefly that the decolonial summer school has been going for eight years now in Middelburg. Middelburg is a very important place for the school because it was the second city in importance in the Dutch slave trade. And it is the first course in this province addressing enslavement as a site of thinking the present. So, uh, so there are still a few places if you want to apply. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting moment of, also for us as, um, as a collective of thinkers and artists, it's a very important moment where we come all together and where we uh, develop our thinking together. Uh, then, uh, I have been also, the last year, part of the diversity discussion in the Netherlands with the Diversity Commission in, of the University of Amsterdam. We produce a report and uh, coordinated by Gloria Becker, and we were engaging with decolonizing education. So what does it mean to decolonize the university? And in terms of, uh, so I think these are two big branches that connect to the summer school. What does it mean to decolonize the university? Not just in terms of diversity of people, but also how the university can become a place for non-Western knowledges as well, for example, and, uh, and non-Western perspectives. And the other uh, angle, uh, <coughs> Connected to it is decolonial aesthetics. So how to decolonize the arts. And just a month ago, uh, we had a workshop here in Berlin at the Berliner Festspiele on the end of the contemporary, which is really the challenge that decolonial aesthetics is posing to the hegemony of contemporaneity and of the Western notion of time over the arts. So I really am very happy to be here and to see this big effort this year to have a program that is challenging the order of exhibition that has a long tradition in Europe, well, since the big world exhibitions that had human zoos, et cetera, to the media today where racism is present everywhere, and, uh, and try to challenge that order of, of exhibition through allowing a different enunciation to appear, other questions to come, into the present and challenge our certainties. And I think certainly for me, the task of humbling modernity is essential. So how can we listen? For me, this is a key question of the decolonial. How can we listen to other frameworks of understanding, to other ways of sensing, to other ways of being human, instead of just reproducing our certainties and representing the other or colonizing, etc. So while well, these are just some topics that we can bring into the discussion later. Thank you. I will, I will ask you a few questions later on to go more specifically on, on some of the terms you used. But thank you for affirming this wonderful transition, actually, uh, when you're, you were saying, like, how can we listen? Uh, Lamine, you are, uh, you are a musician, cultural producer. Uh, you are also working as a... DJ uh, and you um, and there was 
like part of uh, yeah there was an interview uh, about you where they were saying about like you you make like through your art through your music uh, you address the question of for instance the one of the the migration or the one of the the some of the social inequalities and not remaining on the on the sphere of the metaphor you say sometimes the metaphor is something is not not everyone can afford to be on the on a metaphoric level and you you transmit that through your music and through your electro music and uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your work and for instance also about your piece Lampedusa Thank you. Um, yes, um, my name is Lamin Fofana. I am an electronic musician and artist. Um, I DJ most of the time. Um, it's how I get connected to like these kinds of events when um, artsy people need to get down and they need to get a DJ. <laughs> 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 um, so I, um, but I, um, I also. I also produce conceptual like electronic music addressing contemporary issues um the uh the one you're referring to is a release that came out in 2015 um uh and it's titled Another World um uh and it deals with the um, it, it was like the summer of 2015 right when the migrant crisis was um you know it was it was becoming more and more like w we are hearing about it uh, more and more in the in the news and i was living in new york at the time um i i have a cousin who was actually uh, i'm originally from sierra leone um i had a cousin who was living in in senegal and wanted to come to to, to europe of course and he was actually going through the process of like trying to get here um so it was something that and I, i'll talk to him on facebook or on, on the phone when he has time so it was something that was like in my um uh something that that became personal but uh in particular lampedusa um i, I know there was like a big documentary film that just came out like i think uh fire at sea i haven't seen it but i know that it deals with uh, that island and the relationship with like the fishermen um who are no longer fishing much they're just rescuing uh, people or picking up dead bodies um but it, it, the, the the island it, itself like um um was particularly like interesting to me as a electronic musician because we are dealing with the um with the very abstract trying to like produce something about uh a, a, a reality as real as life and death um but um but when you google lampedusa i've i've never i've been to italy but not that south but um all this like picturesque like paradise like like this image uh comes to mind um but um on the flip side of that is uh um it's a there's there's the stations there like holding people um uh, people are in limbo um and um and to get to that place uh to cross from north africa and get to um the S southern european islands it's a uh, um I wanted to convey like a feeling of like like being between catastrophe and paradise bet between um real uh uh like desperation and uh, relief but um in in general most of the pieces that I uh, most of the music that I I work with this is not in the DJ dance floor because um uh I use different voices or different tunes for that uh because people are trying to dance um except if i play if i'm playing live or in my original productions um that's when things like this come up like social inequality and um 
um, um, the man here talked uh, talked about uh, like decolonizing and uh, relatedness, like as resistance, um, and we try to do that as we um, as we work as artists. Like in, um, I have friends that are trying to decolonize the dance floor <laughs> because uh, electronic music, um, believe it or not. Uh, as we know it today, techno and house, popular electronic music uh, came up from um, impoverished gay black youth in the Midwest of America. Um, but you wouldn't know that if you go into any big clubs here in, in, in Central Europe. And, um, and beyond that, like, I, am, I am much, also inter much more interested in the like we're in here and I'm talking about uh, migrants and uh, but um, I only see young African men like Senegalese men in Berlin. I've been living here for like a year. When I go to Yam, there are different spaces, but like you go into like spaces that are like with artists that are trying to like deal with colonialism and decolon post-colonialism and current issues and I don't see those people I play those. I play some of those parties, and I hang out, and I see them. But when I come into spaces, for instance, like this, um, I don't see them. And I think uh, um, uh, th there's definitely something wrong with that. And I think um, I I don't know much about your work, but I'm immediately uh, interested to find out more. Like, how do you go about? Um, um, uh, bringing those voices or like have like an exchange so there can be um, possibility for real change. It's, uh, thank you. It's exactly something that uh, that keeps uh, coming back. Also, if, uh, if we are talking about colonial legacies and contemporary societies, societies also because it's happening like everywhere uh, and it's contemporary it's into our everyday but in so also in the sense that there is a categorization there is a fragmented let's say realities and there is also this uh, this at least this uh, a common need to uh, decolonize our mind our uh, practices uh, the institution um, until the the dance floor, for instance, and uh, some of uh, like the the the, the very um, first um, ways uh, to do that have been often the very first uh, since the last ten years. Uh, it's uh, it's through also bringing in like taking distance from one very subjective approach and knowledge and. Uh, going more and more towards subjective stories, towards perspective. Um, and uh, the initiative of the contemporary and so f uh, positioning itself already in the title uh, from African perspective, I think has been also uh, contributed uh, a lot into this. And uh, Julia, I will ask you uh, if you have to share a little bit about your um, yeah your experience with contemporary yes. and and also uh, like in the beginning how how it started until nowadays uh, to uh, to for the book launch yeah thanks thanks for inviting us <laughs> and um, um, yeah when we started um, four years ago um, we had this um, I don't know maybe hysterical idea to um, create you know that one platform that is, you know, global platform that is able to bringing together, um, you know, creative voices, uh, artists, curators, uh, and directors, writers from Africa in the diaspora, or as we call it, African perspectives. And, um, you know, that was a big goal, um, a big vision in a way. And now, you know, looking back four years later, we're still, you know, so humble and happy to, to look at the result and see that it really worked out in a way, you know, we're looking at a, you know, literally um, worldwide platform with um, uh, collaborators all over the place um, from, you know, uh, uh, Joburg to Oslo, from Nairobi to um, Khartoum, from Cairo to New York, and uh, that makes us extremely happy. And um, in terms of, you know, what you said, um, 
I 100% agree, you know, that was <clears throat> one of our, you know, I don't know, main ideas or wishes as well to reach people, you know, beyond the inner circle of the art world or even more the white, my mainly white, uh, you know, established art world. And um, that's why we always, from day one, wanted to start as an online magazine, you know, in order to be read, you know, in Mali or, you know, in Bamako uh, by students or, you know, young painters who, uh, you know, have never been to a stupid freeze art fair, you know, before and, you know, ma maybe never want to go. <laughs> so, but still, you know, still it was important to us that, you know, the, the art world gets to know about those perspectives as well. So it's, it's not a focused magazine, you know, and um, talking about African perspectives, um, when we use that term, we always <coughs> or om almost use it in a, a political way because, you know, we always repeat this like, <laughs> like hobby uh, preachers, you know, what, what, what is African art and, you know, what, what does it mean? What has a um, performance artist from Joburg in common with a, um, I don't know, painter in Nairobi? You know, nothing really, but still there's this tendency to put this label African art on their practice still today, yeah? And that's what we not even try to overcome. We, s we try to be so beyond all these discussions in our practice, you know, in the articles we produce, the interviews, essays, um, features, etc. cetera. Um, we have a print issue as well, which comes out twice a year, always alongside events such as um, um, Bamako Biennale, Dakar Biennale, or the next one comes out during the documenta in June. So always with a focus and, um, you know, the mixture of being online, of course, you know, being able to be read by everyone all over the world, literally, and um, having a, you know, physical paper is for us, um, you know, just an amazing combination because it, it, you know, it makes an impact if you have, you know, uh, this simple um, print issue in cities such as Dakar, you know, and you see, I don't know, uh, a guy who has a juice bar or whatever, you know, or who's a newspaper distributor sitting there and sit and reading it, you know, and getting to know, okay, there's, you know, a lot going on about contemporary art in Dakar and in Senegal, you know, because it's still, of course, you have those pages or articles in the daily newspaper in Dakar and Nairobi, but it's still, you know, finance, etc., is still the main topic, interest, you know, interesting topic for the readers in the newspapers. You know, but at least that's what the publishers think. But you know, people are interested, and that's what we experienced during the last four years. And um, maybe the last little thing why we call ourselves the end or contemporary end, you know, has this in a way the same approach that for us, you know, f first and foremost, um, it's interesting for us that the artist is working, or working contemporary. You know he's working or she's working contemporary and, you know, that's the end, and maybe uh, is a performer and maybe has parents from Ghana, but that should be something added, you know, uh, or should, com should, should come later, you know, it's, it's not a defining criteria for us, you know, it's important, but it's not something, um, you know, that should be put on the plate as a first thing, you know? oh, this amazing new, you know, conceptual artists from Ghana. This is the tendency, you know, you, you still uh, come across and um, we are try to be way beyond this kind of thinking. Yeah. Merci. It's, uh, yeah, about the, the kind of thinking of being framed and labeled uh, uh, according to the place where you are coming from. Um, I want to ask all of you uh, a question about, again, this kind of, of frame, label. Uh, we, we've heard a lot about um, post-colonial thinking, decolonizing uh, from the practice, the institution, the dance floor. Do you, do you feel like there is a, a kind of, uh, of a hype also of the word uh, and the different words and, and label uh, and uh, uh, that everything is also about decolonizing uh, and that it's becoming something that is being also grasped 
by, uh, for instance, from the academy to uh, in the contemporary art field and uh, where is, for instance, the, 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 the reflection, a little distance in, in something? Maybe it is, it is something that has existed for, for several years. Why it is such a topic right now? And what are the risks, according to you, of this hype, if you think there is a hype? Who is the first courageous one? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> in our, you know, art, art context, um, of course, it's a you know, big topic and you know all the as you say you know all the galleries and museums are kind of you know nervous and forced to open their collections to open their perspective you know to suddenly you know all the art prices go to non-western artists you know and uh, global art is put you know all over you know all over the place all um, programs and, and exhibitions etc and um, of course of course it's a it's not a negative thing, not at all. You know, it's nice to see um, um, that there are a lot of new names beyond the usual suspects. You know, but still, you know, then you talk to I talked to a curator once <coughs> of a bigger museum, and he said, "Oh, you know, all these new names, and you know, we have to do the you know all the exhibitions we have to do, you know, with all these new names, you know, from outside Europe." And I'm looking so forward when I can do a show with. Jeff Koons or Ed Atkins again, you know, this is so, but I have to do it, no? So this, it's, it's, it's a hype and, you know, peop, you know, the museums and the galleries have to open up and the universities as well, but, you know, if you say global art, it's, you know, it's such a tricky term, a bit like African art, you know, it's, um, because I think it's always a bit, I don't know, it's like world music, you know, if you talk about world music, it's not Western music, you know? If they say world music, it's Western music and world music. And if they talk about global art, it's, it doesn't include Western art, you know? It's just the, the other, you know? Instead of saying the other, they just replaced it with uh, global art, that's what we think. And um, um, yeah, of course we react to this, um, you know, we, we get approached as well, a bit like you, you know, we get approached a lot as experts, we turned into <laughs> the super ex experts now, and um, because, yeah, but, you know, m one has to stay sustainable, and, um, you know, it, the circus rolls around, and, you know, uh, right now in our case it's Africa, and in two years it's Asia, uh, maybe India again, Indian art, contemporary Indian art, so, we just stay relaxed and focus on our <laughs> things. Yes, and to, to add to that, um, uh, that's what actually the question that's, that started me to think more about, um, about representation, this uh, museums that were called Museums for World Cultures, because I come from a museology background um, as a student then, and, and starting to think about collections and what, what it means to represent. And then uh, coming to the museum, working now in the museum, I, I see how it goes, and it's really like, uh, who is speaking the whole time? Because when do you label? You label the things that you don't really know, because then you can put it in a box uh, with a label on it. And if you start to see um, that it's a lot of individual practices and a lot of differences that are in between what's happening, and then the labeling itself stops rather than talking about all time. You shouldn't label, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Uh, it's very much about the practice of, okay, so I thought, how do I do that? I'll just start doing programs that uh, force you to see that there are a lot of things under that one label that is being made, like the outreach programs. And um, one of the things I started doing this year is new narrative tours through the museum uh, with people who don't usually come to the museum, all kinds of like diversity in the broadest sense of um, inviting people then coming to the museum and talking. Um, it's not only the tour itself, it's very, I made a really big circle and it was just a sketch and it has been circulating. <laughs> like, what do you mean? What is it? Why is it not a tour? It's not a tour because it is an encounter. It really starts with uh, someone comes into the museum and talks with a curator or someone from an educational department. Um, what do you see? What do you think about? How do you relate uh, to these objects and to the stories that are told here? And then the next step is the tour. It's one part of it. Um, and in the tour, you talk with the audiences or the, the participants and the people who are there, uh, collab um, collecting all these perspectives and taking it also back to the uh, to the museum by inviting people who work there also to participate in the tours. It's not like 
like for your audience because you need to know who the audience is and then talk about it in a meeting and then the circle goes further to okay but if these uh, paintings are not seen as uh, canal um, houses, but as like remnants of slavery. It should be in the database of the collection. So then change the name a little bit, change the tags, and just make it more inclusive in that sense to actually see what it means to make things more inclusive. Because when I realized that nobody actually knew what multiplicity of voices means, what does inclusivity mean? How do you do it? Because if you can't imagine it, then then you can't do it. So we just started doing it, and that's what the basis of the programs is that I start to do because I also didn't know it I talk about it all the time and then yeah how do you actually yeah, I know what what we should reach in the end you know that it's like everybody's happy or inclusive but how do you get there step by step um, yeah I think I mean for me like um, like the context I work decoloniality hasn't arrived <laughs> we're still kind of like diversity is still the new hype word um, that people use within that uh, context, and it's um, and that became a, a quite a hype, and people understand very different things under that term. Um, but when it comes to the term um, decolonial, I think it's it kind of like reminded me when I was back in the t years 2000 when I was studying when people used the word deconstructing, and I think a lot of people use that as a synonym, um, deconstructing things, and I think. Um, I mean, maybe you can also t talk about a bit more what kind of like the understanding of the term decoloniality means, and it comes from a very specific context. Um, but I think when we use it in, in the European context, then the question is who is using that? It's usually um, very privileged um, context, very privileged people, <laughs> and those kind of things. I mean, I think it's we need to be very, very precise in, in using um, that word. And um, I want to just um, want to just comment on what you were talking about um, that when you go to spaces in Berlin and then you um, you hardly encounter kind of like people of color there and like when it comes to electronic music I think the things you were talking about I think they are very um, significant on that because like how uh, for example electronic music is perceived in Germany and how they kind of like why German like Kraftwerk right that is when people think of electronic music that people think on Kraftwerk and that's why a lot of like most people of color never kind of like related to electronic music because it was only to in terms of techno music love parade and those kind of things so it's also very important um, to see what kind of like what kind of like representation um, is um, or what what kind of representation is connected to like specific art forms and who was kind of like yeah Right. Um, I was. I would say, yeah. Uh, in electronic music, in particular, craft work is still really important, though. So, um, because the, the 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 people in uh, the cats in uh, in Detroit that uh, create techno in the early '80s were definitely heavily influenced by craft work. Um, it's just like I don't know if um, you'll have. The Rolling Stones without Muddy Waters. <laughs> um, so Kraftwerk, uh, even though uh, the music um, is um, like uh, unapologetically like Black American, um, like in 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 just like the you know like the the gall, like the, it's just the so. Um, I would s yeah the like so um diversity de decolonization or decolonizing um spaces I, I, that's a uh, yeah I, I agree with you that you have to be very sp like it's the reason why I say I have friends and I did not name them when I say I have friends decolonizing the dance floor because they use that as I'm like mm. um <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Maybe people who know know <laughs> who I'm talking about. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I think that's a term, uh, my first encounter with that, 
um, is uh, the Kenyan playwright, <laughs> author, um, Ngugi Wationgo, Ngugi Wationgo, um, who, um, who wrote a paper sometime in the 60s or 70s called Decolonizing the Mind. Um, and um, I, I, in, that, in that context, like, it was much more about language and writing, um, writing his essays and his plays in his language, Gikuyu. And, um, and then he will take, sometimes the books are like 600 pages and it will take him like two years to translate to English and to, <laughs> but like it's, and it's for, for very, um, um, I don't know how many people were reading it then, but I think he still works that same way. Um, so it's about, uh, you know, it's about, you know, it's, it was around this time too in which like Chinua Achebe is like, you know, the father of African literature. And, um, but it's, it's an approach um, when you say you're decolonizing something, um, it's also uh, um, a thing that's not just about uh, diversifying. It's about uh, um, owning your own. Like it's about self. Um, yeah, it's 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 something that you define on your own. And I think he's talk that way until now. He's in his eighties and. Um, people were mad that he did not win any of the big Nobel pl prizes because, uh, but uh, yeah, so it, it's um, it's something that's like that you that's a conviction like that you can do in your own like personal practice um, um, in that context. But uh, like I do see it a lot around, which is the reason why it seeped into. Um, the art kids and then into the electronic mu music world. Uh -huh. I think it's my turn now. <laughs> 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 uh, ask <laughs> no. um, okay. The, well, it's a difficult question, right? I think there is something good about it circulating so much mm -hmm. because it means it ha the term has arrived and it's not mm -hmm. going away very easily. <laughs> right. Obviously, incorporating it as a fashion is one of the tools of dismantling it or of make, making it silent. And so when it's used as a synonym, the decolonial is used as a synonym of analysis of deconstruction. I'm decolonizing the chair. I mean, they just mean <laughs> deconstructing. Yeah. And without knowing exactly what deconstruction means either. So, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So it becomes part of this uh, language. But um, I mean, for us, it, is, it, is, it brings more serious questions that don't go away so easily, or deep, deep questions, right? And one of, it, uh, one of these questions is how we are all implicated in this history, right? How our histories are connected. And, uh, and recognizing this, question of how we are implicated that the colonial and black feminism has posed is implies that we recognize whiteness, that we recognize privilege. And those are hard questions. You cannot just put them as adjective. You cannot just be comfortable with the decolonial, right? So this is uh, one of the things that's happening. The other thing is that it is not just a literary turn, but it is bringing uh, other forms of knowing into the debates and the scenes, uh, opening spaces for listening. So for us, the knowledge from the social movements, for example, are very important. The vernacular knowledge is the knowledge that don't belong to the text, to philology, to the university. Mm -hmm. These we are considering very seriously as philosophies, as, mm -hmm. as strong knowledges that are questioning modernity as the edifice of knowledge of the West. So we are posing the question of how can we listen to the outside of modernity? Because we are blind to it. We think everything is in our field of legibility and it is not. Mm -hmm. So, and I think one of, some of the strong questions that drive the decolonial, and I think this connects very well to all what you have said, is that there is an ethics to it. 
So it's not just knowledge for knowledge sake or for sophistication or for advancing critique, right? It is a knowledge that is committed to an ethics of justice, of dignity, of processes of healing, because there are still many open wounds in our world that has been under a system of domination during 500 years, right? So, so in that sense, the decolonial brings very deep questions that involve all of us. It calls on us to recognize our position as oppressed, but also as privileged, right? As consumers that are, I mean, we are consuming the world on this side of the world through our way of dressing, our electronics, our supermarkets. And this is thanks to a colonial structure that is still in place, that consumes the life of others, the life of the earth. And so these questions are very hard for us to see and to acknowledge because we want to be in a position of purity where we are not involved. We can speak about justice for the others, but we are not involved in the injustice, right? <laughs> but the decolonial asks you to, to find your own position because you are somewhere in this history of inequality and injustice. And that's why I think it's a question that is not leaving us very soon because it's now in the open and you cannot dismantle it that easy, even if you use it as an adjective. And uh, I mean, the, going back to your first question very briefly, in, in Europe, when we speak about the decolonial, people listen post-colonial, mm -hmm. because that's how people are trained. And yes, the post-colonial is very important for us. But the post-colonial belongs, speaking in general terms in the academia, to a literary turn from literary studies connected to the British Empire, right? And one of, I mean, I'm generalizing, but we don't have time to go into minute detail, but uh, one of the big differences is that the post-colonial aims in some sort of way, it's a strategy, is to say, we are part of the history of modernity, right? Whereas, it's a strategy that is very valid because the history of modernity has been monopolized by the West. But our position, at least of some of us in the decolonial perspective, is different. We say, we don't want to be modern, right? We want to be able to be who we are through our languages, through our dignity, through our, right? And, and this is a different strategy to unstructured Eurocentrism. And then you have many big questions coming on, like decolonizing aesthetics, decolonizing subjectivity. So how we are all built according to that system, right? And where are we standing in that system? Because we are all standing somewhere in that system. So I mean, just to put some things on the, on the floor for discussion. I will, um, the question of the the hype can it can be seen. Uh, of course, it's a it's a provocation, uh, and it can be seen from the very different point of view. And I, as it as it comes right now, it's actually it's symptomatic of of an emergency. It's a state of emergency. It needs to be addressed. It needs to go out of the realm. The risk with the hype, uh, and uh, for instance, there was a similar hype of creating. It went up to creating your own cocktail, and I hope we won't go to the point of creating the, decolonizing the own, co the own cocktail, but there is a big risk behind that, is that like every single hype, there is a timeline, like we have a time window. And um, actually, the question behind that is how do we protect that necessary change? So how, do you protect that within your practices with, for instance, through contamination with the sound and through uh, getting out of the academic privilege point of view through the institution? How can an institution adapt and protect that change through the education? Um, how, how do you protect that? was the last, now I can just pop in with two things very simply. I mean, one, the workshop on the end of the contemporary was w something like, that, like this, right? We were not speaking about the decolonial as a specialist topic or a hype, but we were turning our questions into the contemporary. 
That is how hegemon establishes itself. The hegemony of creating, the hegemony of the institutions. So like calling for the end of the contemporary was a way to say our questions is not just questions from the global south that can be trendy like a cocktail. Mm -hmm. These questions are questioning the center of how art has been managed and dominated, right? So this is one way. The other way is also targeting Eurocentrism, right? In, in terms of the university. Once you teach uh, the students, for example, that Eurocentrism is a type of ignorance, right? It's not that we are against the West, against European knowledge. It's that we see that people that only uh, know the world through that knowledge are very ignorant of the huge diversity of the world, right? And when the students see this, they don't want to be trained only from one perspective. They, there is movements in the universities, and, and not because they are being taught by teachers, they, the students have realized through the movements in South Africa, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in France, saying, we don't want a Eurocentric curriculum. We are being made ignorant, right? So we, we need this knowledge, but we want the other knowledges. We know we need this diversity to understand the complex reality. So you see, it is not about teaching the decolonial, it is about decolonizing, right? So it doesn't become an object of study. It's not a discipline, it's not a speciality, it's an approach, it's a way of doing things that cannot go away. Now the student movements are saying, we don't want a Eurocentric university, right? We want to overcome that ignorance, which we actually call an arrogant ignorance. Because not only you don't know other knowledges, but you believe you have all the knowledge in the world, right? <laughs> Which turns it into an arrogant ignorance. Mm -hmm. So how you humble that ignorance and you create uh, possibilities of intercultural dialogues, seriously, not as ethnographic curiosity or things like that. So in that way, the decolonial, I think, won't go away very easily because it's not a speciality, it's not a, a thing that is leaving us very soon, I think. But obviously, that's my <laughs> position. Yeah, and I think um, I think I, I remember what you were talking about regarding what the students in South Africa last year, like um, going against the actually not even they just uh, question the dress code, like how people wear their hair, um, and for me that's where it gets um, it, it gets. Uh, it get, it gets interesting when it gets real and turn, like you know it's like it starts there like what do you mean I cannot like have braids or I cannot like I don't know I wear my hair as nappy as I want it um, and uh, what does that have to do with studying physics <laughs> um, so uh, um, and it's a uh, yeah I do worry about the like the burnout like especially on the um like in this like in this current time where like everybody is like um just like exhausted like it's like the it's breaking news all the time and you're trying to like deal like unpack like like a historical like baggage like that's just like really like while like in the present is like real human drama that's like unfolding like just constantly like breaking news or something and it's um that i do when i do worry about like the you know that it'll get out of the like something that's like i can be like a um a collective like consciousness like shifting like even though that's kind of like like gradual and and I don't know, hippie-ish, but it's kind of, um, it's uh, like the possibility for that, like if it's like over-exploited or if it's everywhere, um, when um, are people going to like, I don't know, just like pack it up, let's let's deal with the next, you know, the, the next thing. Um, I'm just dropping my two cents in here. Maybe people that are actually doing practical things can, um, but I view it as also like, I don't know, like in the 1920s, like in the art world, like there was like Orientalism, or like there's like, you know, like Man Ray, like being attracted to African masks and 
um, th there's always like a, a wave, just like you know, like the like right now it feels like it's the hot new music genre in the in the art world, like decolonizing, um, and um, so uh, I I I think um, um, from my friend here did put it the right, like just mentioning like the like the the practicality of actually like um like looking at it like head like face to head on um so that gives me hope that it's like at least like <laughs> like there's uh uh there's some positives like that we are actually engaging with it now um um and um hopefully that will like reverberate like beyond the beyond the now the present you know and you mentioning this come back to the students um you know we're experiencing you know similar you know m nice moves when um for example <coughs> young artists i don't know based in accra maybe spend a time for a residency abroad or coming back you know uh and you know it's nothing it's for some of them it's uh, you know and not not longer this dream of you know or dreaming of nothing than um, having a solo show at the Serpentine Gallery in London and so that you know that the interest goes into a different direction now you know that um, you know artists now in their I don't know 50s 60s there was this movement to of course you know go to Holland or live in Belgium but now you know the youngsters are you know going back to Accra or to Nairobi and start their own you know helping or are just part of um, a new artistic infrastructure um, happening there you know um, starting with their own art programs or residencies or uh, artist run spaces and there's a nice um, development we're, s we're seeing or experiencing um, with our work. So it's, um, you know, this, yeah. Um, I think what we, have, what we are experiencing right now, for the last couple of years, I mean, specifically, you mentioned 2015, the summer of t 2015, and um, the, yeah, like, um, refugees being on, uh, like, the, the so-called cry, I mean, people, I don't want to use the term, um, <laughs> but say the, it. Yeah, kind of like the it was, <laughs> um, but and also like the um, Germany's um, uh, yeah policy is kind of like changed and kind of like the so-called like open the door borders and um, so there were a lot of um, yeah so there was a. Um, a huge public interest in refugees, even though people are fleeing for decades, um, specifically to Germany. We have a history of um, yeah, asylum seekers, refugees. I'm coming. I'm having a story myself, um, coming from a um, community that is um, fleeing for four decades, um, and um, but all of a sudden um, the, the public is in, in Germany is we're interested like interested and then um, a lot of money were put into like this kind of area and everybody I know that is working like in, in the field of social justice all of a sudden became so so busy so everybody is kind of like working working really really hard because everybody knows that this time period is going away very soon um, so what we kind of like um, collectively trying to do is est why we have this time frame or this window to establish as much as possible. So for example, the program I'm working at, they more or less started two years ago where they put a lot of money in, um, in German it's called kulturelle Bildung, it doesn't quite translate into arts education, it's more participatory art, socially engaged art. Um, where um, like the the basic idea is um, ki kids and youth who doesn't have access um, to arts kind of like have can be get involved in those kind of things because they find it really important. The broader idea is um, we need to kind of like people need to learn German culture. Um, so one so uh, um, the government is a 
putting a lot of money into cultural education for refugees because they think they can integrate them into German society. Um, so what we have used for the last, and all of a sudden, all these white, white institutions are doing, now they are quite diverse because they're having a lot of like projects with um, refugees. Um, but so it's, um, yeah, the institutions still look like 1950s, but um, yeah, so th what we have trying to do um, within the last two years is kind of like try to point out that this is not a f new phenomenon. The, the, the broader like problem behind it is that these institutions that are mostly publicly funded, so keep in mind each of us who are paying taxes are funding these institutions, but it's only available or accessible for s like, yeah, privileged people, mostly like white people, working class, or, uh, middle class, um, bourgeois. Um, and yeah, in, in, in terms of if you live in a democracy, everybody needs to have kind of like at least the, the possibility to have access to those kind of things. So we're always trying to um, bring the di kind of like the conversation back on that it needs to be um, like on, on terms of equality, um, that it's not just like, yeah, projects with the refugees, but kind of like being accessible to, to everybody and, um, yeah, and, and also kind of like facing and, and um, addressing uh, discrimination. Um, but when, when we are trying to get back to the topic of um, deconstruction and decoloniality, the question is, um, what would be, like, do we want to have these institutions that are highly problematic? They are very hierarchical, so it means like they are they're built f um, for a male leader. Um, so y you don't just can put, I don't know, a trans person of color into that topic. It's not built, these institutions are not built for kind of like diversity, they're built for specific social groups. Um, so what we need to do is um, kind of like reorganize these institutions. Um, and also the question of art. So the, 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 the understanding of how we understand art is a very Euro Eurocentric one. Um, it's very like, most non-European um, cultures have a completely different understanding on this is art, this is culture, this is, these are cultural rit rituals. Um, and the, also that, that is also a question um, that needs to be in, in mind. So we, we can't just go and um, yeah, diversify the institutions and make them more accessible, but at the same time we need to have transform um, the understanding of um, of art and um, also how do we how um, institutions um, work? They need to be more collaborative um, because, like these hierarchicals are authoritarian. Authoritarian is very pa patriarchal, um, yeah, system. Um, well, maybe just to continue on the the, the idea of collaboration. Um, um, well, for me, it's, it's very interesting to all the time to, to study what do you do, what do you mean with collaboration? Collaboration is often like inviting someone, but not really, but on your own terms, like all these things that I, 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 talk, I talked, I didn't talk about it a lot, I read about it a lot, and then I realized, okay, how do you do this in practice? And because I'm a very practical person, so I like to think, how do collaborations work then? Because, uh, for example, the museum is now starting to work with all kinds of institutions and um, to make exhibitions in different places than the museum itself. For example, um, the project that I will do this year is with um, um, black archives. It's not like it's not a final. Shouldn't uh, it's not like final yet? But I'm gonna talk about it anyway because it's really interesting and really necessary to talk about it before it's happening rather than afterwards saying like collaboration didn't go so well. Um, <laughs> but because collaborating is um, for me, it's it's really needed to as a white institution if you collaborate with uh, black archives. Okay. How do you do that? Do you do you do it yourself? Do you do you know that this is about your terms? Um, 
Probably not. So I, as for me, being half in and outside the institution, because it's important to mention I'm still a freelancer, but I've, I'm there every day, so it feels like I'm in the institution. Um, so in as a freelancer, I feel that I have the space to say what are my terms, to do a collaboration, to mediate in uh, between different parties, and to set the terms on um, on what the other party would want. And I in practice. Um, what what was most interesting to me was the idea that both different parties have that collaboration is something that um, it should be right from the start that the, the process is it should come out at a certain point and everybody should be happy but um, it's still so difficult to have this struggle I, spe I don't know if it's very specific to the Netherlands but to talk about how do you not use uh, racist terms and and could anyone be racist or we but we mean so well like all the cliches they happen all the, all the time um, and the discussion about it is so difficult that's probably everywhere but but I feel especially in the Netherlands at this point when with the black Pete uh, discussions going on and with an, inst um, an organization that has a lot of activists who were, were also like in, in the middle of these um, I should probably explain the whole story but I'm afraid it's going to be really long <laughs> so um, if you need any clarifications please ask any question of course <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, maybe we could go back to it because um, it will be a very long story but collaboration for me the most interesting thing and the most relevant thing is that it starts from a discussion that takes place and it keeps being a discussion like what do you need, what do you want, what is interesting to you, what is relevant to you um, and I'm realizing that that should be the most important part and not the, not the um, for example, activists saying you cannot do this or you can do that and then the museum saying like yes, but uh, yeah, so I'm realizing that it's these little steps of, of having the discussion all the time, it's probably very obvious but it's not happening at all. There is, uh, there is an element that keeps coming back in the conversation is the notion of, of language and, and words. There are the labels that we want to get rid of. There are the words we are afraid to use and there are the words we didn't find yet. So how actually do we, do we talk about these topics when we are so all the time afraid of words and not, not finding the right words? How do you do that in your practice? What are like the languages uh, that you use, uh, there is, for instance, um, this 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 idea of. Uh, for me, it's it's easiest because I would switch to maybe another language, and even if it doesn't make a lot of sense, that's the only in another language I I can grasp it and maybe explain it. Uh, there are like, for instance, there was a project that was uh, one year ago. Uh, called Politics of Sharing in the IFA Galerie, and it was about translating, uh, transla translating a word, so it was the Indonesian word of the Numpang, which was um, about this idea of, of sharing a moment, sharing a space, sharing an interaction. Um, so it's, it's really about like, how do you work with words? How do you write? How do you transmit with the education? Uh, when you are sometimes afraid to use some of the words. Um, yeah, I think what I was trying to say is that um, what you were saying, Alana, about the implicatedness, that it's something that I think that should be the most interesting thing at this point to discuss, like not the whole time like um, other artists and the other person, but really this either the interaction between people or like explicitly making a show about whiteness like who's I, that would be like the, my dream <laughs> to do <that. laughs> so to not me to make it but then to have something that is not always because i feel like in a white institution so often that people look at me for answers and everybody wants to do so well and it's so admirable that you want to do it well but where is the the focus on failure on on doing something that probably is wrong for someone else the discussion about that and rather than skipping to the part like but how do we do it in a way that every Everybody's happy because, of course, that's not going to happen, and it also shouldn't happen. Um, yeah. So, in short, to to f to focus on this process in between, it would be so. Yeah, it would be so great if that was more valued. And to um, yeah, and how do you do that in a culture where you need to score and have all the points and 
to to do something well to be a best practice somehow because you never of course present a show that you're not sure about or to do things that you're not sure about because it takes time and time is money and yeah not to make this into complaining but <laughs> <laughs> so um in, in terms of our <coughs> daily practice um we of course work with a um not strict but we have our style sheet of words and no words, you know, words we're not using. Um, we thought long, you know, before coming up with African perspectives by, you know, trying to avoid, you know, that idea African art we're not believing in, you know. That's why we had to find an alternative um, um, description for that instead of not saying Africa at all, which is a bit tricky as well, but for example, the whole, com you know, the whole title of C End is um, on the website C End, and then platform for international art from <coughs> African perspectives. And we um, just recently got rid of this subtitle because we thought, you know, um, which is a nice thing. Many people know what we're doing, and many people approached us as well. You know, be it, I don't know in Bamako or in in Venice, and said, "Oh, why do you still have this subtitle? You don't need this subtitle anymore." You Focus without focusing, you know, that's what we do in a way. We have this focus, but we don't sit on this and talk about this focus, you know. And uh, maybe it's the same thing with the wording. Um, um, we, don't, we don't use, you know, a long list of words, but we don't preach about it, why we don't use them. We just don't use them, you know. We just um, kind of work beyond this or try to get many steps, you know, ahead of... Um, you're not allowed to use, um, um, I don't know, colored or whatever, you know, we just, um, um, yeah, try to go beyond these. And um, still, <laughs> you know, the a nice side effect is that with this little, for example, African perspectives, um, you know, colleagues, journalists, colleagues in, in Germany especially, um, stumble over this um, Afri Afrikanische Perspektiven. Of course, it's not... You know, um, grammar-wise, it, it doesn't sound really elegant. It's a bit holprig, you know, a bit but But um, um, they start to learn, and you know, when they approach us, can you, can you write about something? Um, can you write a feature about Dakar or something? They say, uh, f about Afri African perspectives. You know, they, they try to learn as well, you know, from art magazine, etc. They, you know, they're open to learn, you know, and it's I think it's, it's a good... Um, Good move, and then still you have um, moments where you think, okay, um, we were approached by um, an American art magazine to um, to write something. Oh no, the magazine of Art Basel, <laughs> and um, about you know their their big magazine for the fair in Miami, and um, we were approached, you know, as curators and had to write about you know what we do and um, feature some new voices from Africa and the diaspora, and we thought, okay, I think they. They're cool, and then the piece came out, and the bloody headline was "Bloody Out of Africa," and we were like, "Fuck!" You know, "Out of Africa" was the, the headline, yeah. And we thought, and it was Yvette and myself and another um, black curators, you know, who were featured there. And we thought, "My God, how can they?" You know, an American magazine write fucking out of Africa, you know? And that was the, you know, and this still happens. You know, even in the U.S., where you think, "Oh my, that should be a bit more clever," but you know, in Germany, would okay, there's still, you still read these funny things, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it, we, we, we're, we're on the case. Huh? I, think, I think there was a popular, like, American film with that title. Oh, really? At some point. Never. In, like, the in Germany. <laughs> What's the German? Jenseits von Afrika is the German. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. And they even so. thought maybe, oh, what a nice headline. A genius, huh? Oh. Right. <laughs> I think I'm always fully aware which spaces I encounter and which words I use. Um, for example, racism, I don't use uh, most of the times when I'm in the context of, like, I don't know, when when we meet, we have meetings with a city or something, we use the word diversity, we use the word discrimination, but those kind of things as racism, um, you still need to be, yeah, it's still, seen really problematic because how they define racism is mostly like um, racist violence, it's um, right-wing violence, so, um, and they don't see it mostly in kind of like an, as a structural and institutional problem. 
Um, when it comes in terms of um, using um, less offensive words, um, we, tr we usually try to go um, for yeah, with definitions, communities use, right? Mm -hmm. So we use those kind of words as um, people of color or um, black German or Afro-German or uh, Romney and Roma. Um, the, 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 the words uh, the communities themselves use. Um, but kind of like in, in this, um, yeah, kind of like mm, public funded <laughs> space, I mean, a lot of, yeah, let's say, face it, white people get offended by us using those kind of words because a lot of times these are the words that they have been, they haven't heard about before. Um, so they're like, oh, this is kind of like, this is offensive or why are you using that or why are you t pointing that out? Um, so yeah, it's kind of like how to deal with, because I, th I think a lot of like the German discourse is quite referring to, maybe that's a bit different, for example, in France or something, but the German discourse is quite, um, yeah, kind of like looking or influenced by the US American mm. discourse. Um, so for example, like the, the term people of color is kind of like referring to um, civil rights movement in, in, in the US. Um, and the and then on the other hand you don't have a public discourse in or you didn't have the civil rights movement here right you had it in the US you had it for example in the UK and I think this is also really important um, what kind of like changes within um, a community or within a society happened that you're able to talk about specific things. I mean, in Germany, it's kind of like we had an environmental movement, so everybody is kind of like recycling. Mm -hmm. But it's not, yeah. <laughs> but if you, if it's like, but people don't, I mean, like the NSU um, killings, hardly anybody went on the streets, right? I mean, that, that was just like one of the, most like uh, I don't know like tremendous things that came out a couple of years ago that there was a right, right-wing terrorist group going around killing people mm -hmm. um, and nobody went on the streets so th this is kind of like the yeah the, the the public discourse we're facing and if you want to try to encounter kind of like those kind of things as racism you always need to keep those kind of things in mind um we try to establish words by using <laughs> introducing them um yeah step by step but we still need to be really careful in which context you're using also like those kind of things as white um is um yeah that people feel a lot of no but but i mean i agree what, what you're saying but it's like you confronted with backlash so much so it's always kind of like to yeah keep in mind what what you need to do but step by step we're going there and i think i also wanted to point out um that one of the re i think it's really important to keep in mind that um the event for example tonight that we can talk about colon like yeah colonialism is really much um based on the hard work that f the afro-german community has up to the last 30 40 50 years i mean if th it hadn't been up to them um fighting <laughs> that and and kind of like um yeah pointing out those kind of things germany wouldn't kind of like own up to their colonial past we would still kind of like they would say oh that was just like that wasn't that important it wasn't just a short period <laughs> look at the brits they they had like hundreds and hundreds of years we only had like 40 years or something so um so i think th those kind of things is also really important too i mean for me it always helps to see those struggles to kind of like look all those struggles peop people have up to um, to keep the okay, we, we, we can go a bit step further. Um, we need yeah. yeah. So the the civil rights movement was um, uh, Anglo was not just like an Anglo American. At least I was going to ask you, but then you answered that there was something else 
you know, there's the Afro-German uh, who have been here, so they, they, they also fight and struggle, and you, you mentioned that, so that's great. Because, um, of course, like, uh, sometimes, like, you know, there's such, like, a long way to go that we forget, like, that we are um, standing on, like, the, uh, as the, we're standing here as the byproduct of, like, a lot of other people's hard work also. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say about language, um, <laughs> if you're interested in how I use it, <laughs> but I, it, it, it's how it starts for me, like, with words and f before I work on, on sound or something, like, um, and at this particular time, like, I am interested in, like, uh, the word empathy. Um, I'm doing a, a project um, for next month. I'm wrapping it up now uh, for the Venice, uh, for the Biennale. And um, it's, um, it relates to the, uh, oh, it's, it's titled Witness. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's mo I, I mean, it's mostly, it's about empathy. It's about that, you know, the ability to like, oh, possibility to comprehend the emotional, mental state of another person when you encounter them in the street. Um, or, j I mean, when you have that exchange between, you know, uh, because I think there's a, like over here, hmm, I feel like I wanna conduct like a, a little experiment. How many people here have been pickpocketed? <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Okay, yes. Um, okay. And we are th th there, should be, there should be, there should be, yes, it works. There should be a follow-up to this. But I would say, um, it's like, um, like th the amount of time I walk down the streets and see people like, you know, just guarding their pockets or their purses. It's a daily occurrence. And, you know, I'm, I'm not that rich, but I'm not that broke yet to, to start like, <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> no, but it's uh, it's you s you s encounter a young African man. That's yeah, yeah, and if you're sensitive, um, to this, and you know, you know it, you see it, um, it happens. So fucking often. Um, that that's not to say that uh, uh that it's not a real thing, because people warned us that w when we were moving here that pickpocketing is a thing like and and uh, I think there's like this general like it's constantly beamed up on people but um, I, I went off on a tangent there but <laughs> but uh, my the project in, in, in Venice uh, relates to um, empathy. empathy and there's a uh, in January of, uh, of this year um, a young uh, Gambian man, a 22-year-old uh, Gambian named Pate Sabali, um, who was living over there, jumped into one of the canals and drowned. And there were people on the Grand Canal, and nobody, they threw him some life rings, and no one jumped in to save them. Um, and uh, this, uh, so, and they, they yell insult while witnessing this, like swim back to Africa or... Uh, <laughs> we dance, but not now. <coughs> Wait one hour and then we're there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this is like a tragic comedy here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, the irony. Um, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's that, like, it's like, how do you... Um, um you know the just like the indifference like the, the the like inhuman indifference to like to relate you know or to um that this thing can occur um broad daylight there are videos online on the guardian website and in uh italian newspapers and in other european that this uh, uh, this thing can, and um, and and uh, and it's uh, it's a it's it's someone who has received like their residency papers also. So uh, there's a layer to it. Like he was going through something, and it's uh, uh, 
it's a suicide as a protest. Um, and um, and this, uh, this project I'm doing over there that I'm wrapping up uh, uh, deals with like the possibility of empathy in public spaces. So when you encounter people, at, you know, and v Venice is a strange place. Yeah. Uh, um, I was there for the first time a uh, couple of months ago working on this, like, and it's like, you know, it's one of those places that you, the only my only reference is like Shakespeare, Merchants of Venice, or something. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's uh, it's like um, it's like aggressively like superficial, and um, we know. But also, there are real people there. They're like. People from uh, young men from Afghanistan doing tricks on San Marco Square, like playing with pigeons, and so there's there's one there's like a a, a contrast there between like real uh, like like real human struggle survival, and then there's you know two thousand dollar Gucci belt. Um, yeah. So it's um, the like particular words like 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 that kind of like trigger how I, uh, um, uh, you know, how I approach sound, to sound art. To, to uh, thank you for this example because it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a very strong illustration of with, with one word uh, that can be used in completely different contexts. You really bring together different realities. So for instance, of Venice, of the one of, uh, what they would call like the vous compras, so uh, the, the the people who are there who have extremely precarious uh, life uh, and who are uh, labeled under vous compras, like voi comprare if you want to buy something, and who are looked in quite uh, yeah down upon. Uh, and the another reality of Venice, of for instance, this uh, the two thousand uh, euro bag, and to bring that around the word of empathy and to, to use this word, to focus on it, to take it as a starting point is a beautiful illustration. Another um, illustration, and Rolando, that's where I would like to, to, to ask you about, is on the, the creation of words and on this, this uh, explaining them, defining them. Like before, for instance, when you were talking about the, the ice thesis, um, it's... Um, what what are these words? How do you uh, protect them? How do you promote them so that they go out of, uh, let's say, a closed circle of um, the, and I would quote Yvette for that, out of uh, preaching the converted? How do you get it out of the, the converted? Um, there are many topics coming up. Um, OK. Yes, I think this is one aspect of the question of language, right? So. In the decolonial, well, I, I want to say a few things. Let me end up with this, so you can remind me. Uh, but first, I wanted to connect with what was said before, because I think there is an important trajectory of decolonial thesis in Germany, coming from struggles or opening spaces. And that is uh, particularly in connection to our group, the BBOP, the Black European Body Politics, that has happened in Berlin several times that is dedicated to Afropean thesis and to the decolonial. It's created by Alana Lockward, and it's been part of the conversation with the decolonial summer school in Middelburg. So the, I think it's important to see that these efforts are collectives, and they belong to also local histories. And Berlin is an important place for us in that aspect. Uh, language, yes, I mean, there are several dimensions to it. I think the most important is what Mara was saying at the beginning of who is speaking. So I don't think we need to fetishize that one word should mean something specifically, which is often the debate in our circles. Intellectual circles are debating about the meaning of one word. But one word changes its meaning depending on who is speaking it and in relation to what history, right, and to what present. So this is uh, basically what we've learned from feminism, from mainly Afro-feminism, decolonial feminism, Chicana feminism, indigenous feminism, that is, uh, 
when you know your positionality, where are you speaking from, then the language takes a different form or a different content, right? And, and then you cannot have a position of abstraction. In our universities, we are normally trained to speak from nowhere, from the unmarked position. That is normally the position of whiteness, right? So we are not re really responsible. We are just objective, looking at the world as an object. And then language becomes reified into a thing. But when you are writing from a position that locates you, then language is more truthful. It's not universal, but more truthful because it's speaking from somewhere and somebody is responsible to it, right? And then we can begin talking, right? So that's why the decolonial presents itself as an option. We call it the decolonial option because it is not a, uni a new universality or a new truth. It is an option to think the world that by positioning itself as an option, it is also saying we will not accept another position as universal. Any other position is also an option. Right? And then we can talk. So I think this is type of what we need to do. Another movement we are doing quite strongly is to move from thinking in terms of nouns to think in terms of verbs. So for us, verbality the doing, the decolonizing is what is important, not to define the decolonial, right? So you don't reify the discussion about one thing, like the chair. No, we want to speak about chairing, about doing, <laughs> about empathy as a verb, empathizing, right? Mm -hmm. Overcoming isolated subjectivity, where you are just centered in yourself, and how can you transgress that isolation and reach the other, right? Mm -hmm. What are the conditions for that? So, and this is, so this is, I think, what is most important for me, what we do with language, not just what word is there, or what, if it's English or French, or, I mean, that's important in many aspects, because language carries a, a history, right? It carries a history of colonialism, and some words carry a horrible history of, of destruction of the other person. So we also need to be aware of that. It's part of the positionality, right? Of recognizing that we belong to a connected history. Now, in terms of our theoretical work, yes, we deal with developing concepts, but, but we don't think that that's, like the social movements have to take the, the concepts we develop. Not at all. We are trying to listen to what they are doing and not being like, the organic intellectual that is designing the new world, but we are trying to listen and to accompany the struggles that are happening, to accompany the stasis that is already happening or has always been happening outside the dominant gaze, etc. And in that sense, we have the need of bringing words that don't belong to the what I call the geogenealogy of the West. Right? So the word coloniality not colonialism and not post-colonialism. Coloniality comes from a thinking that is not possible from within the Western framework. It comes from the experience of having been colonized, mm -hmm. right? And that cannot be thought from here. That needs to be thought from the bodies that have been colonized. And it is the coming into voice, the coming into legibility of a completely different set of questions that cannot be thought through a Western genealogy, right? Foucault could not have thought that because he was not in that position. He's a brilliant thinker, but he could not have thought that. These were not his questions, right? So this is what is important for us. Thank you very, very much. It was, uh, yeah, as I said in the beginning, inspiration uh, for the the whole program, and it was uh, it was wonderful to be to be able to listen all, to all of you. And uh, I, I would like to to open for question, and um, and also um, I think we will have a small yeah catering buffet finger food. Uh, so if you yes, if you want to, to help yourself, you're more than welcome. But it's 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 a, it's a common like you were you were talking about learning to to listen, and it's as it's really as as a common approach, and a, like it's it's listening to your also your intervention, your your question on that, and it's it's a common conversation. So please feel free if you have any question. Thank you. 
Oh, how does it work? I am Michaela Ott, uh, Professor of Aesthetic Theories at the HFPK in Hamburg. I am very interested in this uh, question uh, of the end of contemporary art or the contemporaneity or how, how I mean, what do I have con to conceive under this topic? I would really like to, more, to know more about that. That is coming to me, that question. <laughs> um, well, I think the next issue of contemporary <laughs> and we'll have a little dossier on the workshop we did at the Berliner Festspiele on the end of the contemporary. It's a very complex topic, so I cannot just speak it like half an hour. But it is basically the idea that the notion of contemporaneity has become normative, right? And normative not just, it presents itself as radical openness, but it has a temporal framework. So, so it's, it has a normative temporality that presents the now as, uh, well, that's why you can, I cannot explain it in this short time. It, yes, okay, I will tell it very shortly, but it doesn't make any much sense if the, the ontology of Western thought is based in a duality between transcendence and immanence. We are now in a period of where radical immanence is celebrated and the diversification of that. And uh, sorry, I'm kind of switching to a more conceptual language, but and, and in that celebration of radical immanence, what is missing is a notion of temporality that comes from many other traditions of thought that we conceptualize as a notion of precedence. And precedence is a mode of being into the world that cannot fit into transcend transcendence because it's not going towards a futurity or a utopia. And it also doesn't belong to immanence because it has been excluded from the present. It belongs very closely to notions of ancestrality that you find in thinkers of the global south. So, I mean, this is to say it shortly, there are many texts we are writing about it, so I can send it to you if you give me your email. But it is very grounded in ontological discussions on very deep philosophy and practices of artists that are practicing the colonial aesthetics as distinct from contemporaneity. So, and we had a very intense discussion during a whole week of seminars at the Berlin Festspiel. Hi, I'm Shubangi and I'm from Bombay and uh, I'm a writer and a journalist and I learned a lot, when I started reading African literature, it, it inspired me in a way that reading the Western novels didn't because that always felt like a corset, very sort of stifling in a way, the voice. And uh, I want to... It's, it's an open end. I mean, I'm still searching for the answer. I don't know why I must travel to Europe to learn about African arts and literature. Why Asia and Africa do not have greater direct, uh, direct interaction in terms of just artistic and socialist movements. Because to me, that would be such a um, strong aspect of decolonization. I must go to London and look at the museums. I must visit libraries of translation. And we are experiencing a lot of racism against African citizens in India. And although India has very unique and fundamental forms of inequality, we are like uh, very experienced in all kinds of inequality. I feel this is something we are also inheriting, you know, in this long route that we are experiencing Africa from the white man's perspective. So how do we do it? Yeah. Um, I think I came across um, very, very, like a couple of weeks ago, 
um, that my family or my mother is from Shiraz, uh, that's in South Iran, and they had in the late 60s and the early 70s a performance festival. And um, I recently I heard a presentation on that um, performance festival. And what they were doing at that time, because that was a period of um, anti colonial movement, and there was a kind of like a this is a period of um, the non aligned um, movement. Um, which is, um, yeah, non-European countries coming together and trying to think of a different world. Um, and so th their approach was really not looking t towards Europe, but to looking everywhere else. For example, he had like statistics on performance groups where they invited people to come along. And um, like I think the, the country, there were mostly like performance groups coming from was from India. So people like the Perform. So I think maybe we need to, we also need to go to specific times and kind of like learn history from a different uh, from a different angle and then of course I mean lo the whole um, Cold War and those kind of things I mean undermined those kind of like um, yeah movements and and approaches on that so I think it's it's also really interesting like to keep in mind that it's not the first time people are trying to see the world in a different way, to um, have a different, mm, how do you call it in English, uh, cut talk, how do, what is this? Cartography of the world as we have it right now. Um, yeah, we need to do some diggings as well. <laughs> I, I think one of the issues of raising, of bringing different vocabularies into the conversation mm -hmm. It's not just to bring the radically new, but it's to illuminate what has happened before right. and knit it together and allow other readings of, of the traditions that have happened, but that we cannot read with the vocabulary that is dominant. So it's not about inventing something that has not yet happened, but about recovering and recognizing other trajectories that we have been unable to see or to relate. So it's a, it's a work of relating, right? Just um, one other thing that is important and that is more maybe an eternal non-European conversation we need to have is also to recognize our own imperial um, history, right? I mean, I was referring to, I'm coming from Iran, we have a history of imperialism, India has a history of imperialism, so other countries have that as well. We need also to not only focus on on um, the European history, but kind of like the global history because that that helps us as well to recognize um, if you want to go and have ally like allyship within non-European communities, we need to consider those kind of things as well. And um, also, I would say that there are spaces or, uh, vo or institutions and places in Africa, in Ghana, or there are efforts being made by people to draw that to to draw that map or that. Um, to make that cartography, um, it's it's there. Like I'm not uh, like super familiar, but I every now and then I read an article about um, someone who's um, trying to create like the anthology of African art, or, like traveling around all of the countries and working with like curators and um, um, and artists, and so. Um, um, while there's that, like, um, you know, because the Western, like, hege hegemony, like, or the, c the control, uh, or the, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for, like, the, it's still, uh, the, the, the attraction, just because of, I don't know, history and, and who's, who's rich, who has more money, uh, is still here. There, um, and there is a relatedness, or so connect connectedness uh, going on, but within Africa, in uh, South Africa, Nigeria, I'm, I'm, I'm naming all the rich countries because, <laughs> um, because they, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, is, there are places um, to learn about Africa, uh, African art in Africa, in, in Dakar, in, um, in Bamako, in, in Freetown, in Conakry, all over, so there's that.
there is uh, the relatedness uh, and that we are celebrating, but there is also the richness or the, the difficulty to reach for some also very, very pragmatic reason. It's uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's also more possible because uh, less expensive to fly, for instance, from Casablanca to Paris uh, uh, if we want to reach Bamako. And uh, I think it's also like a very, very pragmatical uh, reality we are, we are uh, dealing with, uh, which also yeah, make this kind of, uh, let's say, more horizontal uh, and less, let's say, a triangular her relation a little bit more complicated. I will uh, open for one last question because unfortunately we don't have a lot of time. Maybe it's more a comment than a question, but uh, I find some things uh, really interesting to think about. Like you mentioned the difference between post-colonial uh, thinking and decolonial thinking, and I think there is a big difference. I mean, even though I recognize that uh, for many white people it is difficult to deal with uh, post-colonial theory already, uh, and I don't mean uh, surfing on the surface, but really going deep into it and being busy with it for years. Um, what I find much more striking is if you if you look at decolonial texts. Um, they are more than 100 years old. Um, so we speak about uh, Senghor, Césaire, all of these people, Fanon, etc. You mentioned Watyongo, Shoyinka, etc. What, what I find striking is the decolonial thinking is much more political than the post-colonial thinking is. And it is related to the question like, is, is it becoming a fashion or a trend to speak about decolonial um, aesthetic, decolonial arts, etc. I think one of the, one of the dangers is um, if, if we are not historizing uh, knowledge, knowledges, fragments of knowledge, then it, it seems as we would deal with a new issue, even though it's a very, it's a very old issue. And um, another thing what I want to mention, I mean, so far one of the questions would be like, um, what do you think about your own, I mean, if you position your own in this context of uh, decolonial thinking, where do you see it critically when we speak about the art world, you know, because decolonial thinking has much also to do with thinking about resources, production chains, flying over here and there, having visa, etc., all these things, but much more than that. And another, and also hierarchies, questioning hierarchies and dependency all the time, even within the cultural institutions, you know, um, and um, who, is, who is somehow... Um, making which discourse st uh, strong, where are the funds going, uh, with what kind of wording, to which time, etc. But then there is another thing um, what I want to mention because I think it's important. Um, Rashid Arin, one of the um, really important um, art historians who, who created the third text publication about decolonial thinking, um, he did it in the 60s, 70s already, and what he said was like, it is really crucial for Western institutions to, to deconstruct um, their philosophical underpins. Like, as long as this is not done, the decolonial gesture will go on in any way. And I think this is really important to think about what does that mean? I mean, not only who can speak, but what would it also mean for Western institutions really to decolonize themselves? What kind of process it could be? How long does it take? What does it really mean in detail, you know? I mean, sorry, maybe some, some of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I, I do agree. There are many differences, right? We are working from different archives, from different historical situations. The post-colonial is very much connected to literary cultural studies in connection to the historiography of India initially. Uh, so, so yes, the decolonial has, is political. That, that's why I'm saying it is engaged with the question of justice and historical justice. So it's not just a knowledge that is um, open for just curiosity or amplifying the canon, but it is dealing with the question of injustice, with the question of what we call the colonial wound. And then how you address that. One of the angles, I think the most serious struggles are happening across the world, for example, with indigenous communities, with Afro communities that are struggling to preserve their lands, or that are struggling for their rights as migrants. So I think that's where the decolonial struggle is happening. Now, our task in, the, in this type of institutions 
is to accompany it, to listen to it, and to to engage in what we call the epistemic struggle. How we how we challenge the pillars that keep on making invisible those struggles, that keep on in erasing them from thinking the world. And I think this is what the student movements are claiming. We are being trained as global citizens and we don't know anything about those struggles. We don't know anything about what's going on in the world because they have a blind vision, uh, this ignorance of Eurocentrism that doesn't allow them to see the dimensions of these struggles for for dignity across the planet, right? So so in that sense, we, we think we also need to humble the position of the intellectual because in, I think in the decolonial, the intellectual is not at the center and should not be at the center, but it does has to do something wherever he or she is positioned in an institution to to deal with the epistemic struggle, to how to open the institutions. The report we wrote for the University of Amsterdam, you can download it for free, it's called Let's Do Diversity. We have a big chapter of recommendations policy recommendations on, on how to decolonize the university, mm -hmm. right? How to take it really seriously, because it's possible. It's not just an ideological debate. I think I just want to quickly point out um, then if, if we <coughs> talk, talk about it in, um, in the context of art and um, specifically like um, Berlin and the museums, um, if you look at if what would happen if the arts institute or museums would take um, the question of decolonizing seriously, then if they look at the collections, then maybe it's a question of reparation, rep reparations and maybe also a question of giving back to those cultures, um, which is a complicated question, I know. Um, but the, um, but the um, what's, what's really outraged is like the conversation become to the point that a lot of, um, if you look at the Berlin context, um, I mean, they, are, they have a lot of um, objects from um, Iraq, um, from Syria and um, Egypt. And then like it becomes, um, yeah, it be becomes quite interesting when they talk about, oh, lucky we brought it all over here because now it would be de destroyed by the war, not taking into consideration that actually um, like the reason for this 100 year long kind of like conflict that turned into wars in that region, in that area, is was, um, yeah, colonialism. Um, so this is also like connected to that if we look at the art world, yeah. I think, as uh, as we mentioned a lot during this conversation, it's a it's a multi-layered, complex uh, stories that we are all uh, we are all part of. This it's uh, it's share it's collective memories. It's uh, the conscious and unconscious one. It's the outspoken and the silenced one. We are we are all. Uh, we are all part of it, and uh, to give an example and quote uh, Pascal Martin Tailloux, who is uh, uh, at the moment showing uh, the work, uh, his work at the uh, at the, the gallery and the IFA, and the IFA gallery, when he's talking about colonial legacies and contemporary societies, his approach is to say, it's it's part of all of us. Now we need to learn how to deal with that in an inclusive way, so not reproducing this idea of the other and this uh, more like, an, again, a separation, but like how do we commonly deal with that and project ourselves in, uh, in the future? Um, if no one has more questions, mm -hmm. I, I will like partially uh, make, um, yeah, it's, it's not the end. Actually, it's the beginning of something else, of eating together and dancing together because we have uh, the party, which is also starting in, uh, in a few minutes, I guess. And uh, so before transforming in the dance floor, one very, very, very important word for me is merci to all of you for taking the time for this amazing conversations and uh, to be continued actually in a, in a few minutes. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Very much.